This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. What if I told you, you have always been and will always be everything you have ever been searching for? Valeria Tellez interviews Gregory Bondi, the author of Songs of Silence, poems to accompany you on the journey home, volume one. Gregory aspires to and values direct non-dual teachings, seeing them as invaluable pointers to truth and to the recognition of the freedom that arises from an absolute knowing of self. Gregory offers non-dual teachings and initiation into the direct path through individual mentoring and retreats, sacred satsang poetry, inquiry explicitly for the direct exploration of self, and inquiry to clarity work to refine how self is moving through this precious and unrepeatable life. Meet Gregory at fireandemptiness.com. Here is the interview with Gregory Bondi. In your own words, who is Gregory Bondi? Well, I would have to really answer that as truthfully and authentically as possible. And from a realistic position and perspective, um, Gregory is just an idea. It's just a thought that's arisen spontaneously and will go back into emptiness. So I could dress that up for you, for your viewers. <laughs> I could make it very appealing, make it very attractive. But, but the truth is, you know, that is only something that is arising within me. And what is me is something that's permanent and uh, everlasting. What are thoughts, really? Oh, gosh, that's such a, a great question. I don't think anyone's asked that to me before. I think we take for granted so many things um, without really plunging into the depths of understanding them. Um, I would have to say from my direct experience of thought, you know, thoughts arise from very distinct centers in the body that have to do with gripping and some type of survival. Um, and they're condition centers from uh, millions and billions of years of conditioning to survive. And I, you know, I recognize that the thoughts well up from these places. And most of the thoughts, whew, I would say, gosh, 90 to maybe 99% of them are non-functional thoughts. You know, they stem from stress and anxiety about survival. And then there's functional thoughts that I think are really appropriate and functionally appropriate for, for daily life, which is, um, you know, I need to get food. <laughs> um, I need to eat. I need to take care of my body. But if we truly investigate what's going on in, in our minds, it, it really is a, a deep anxiety about some type of power and survival, mm. you know, of an individual I. So does that answer your question? I'm not, you know, I'm not entirely sure. Mm. I, I think I can just tell you where I see thoughts coming from. And they bubble up all of their own and spontaneously and then arise within the space. And then uh, most of what comes to mind is intuition. Is that another form of thought or somehow different? I think, you know, I don't think about intuition so much. Mm -hmm. um, I, I realize that in this capacity of consciousness, right, which I think arises within awareness, consciousness has so many capabilities, endless capabilities of mm -hmm. development, mm -hmm. and, and intuition seems to be one of them. Um, intuition seems to connect to sort of the, the causes and conditions that are already in motion. 
and then we can connect to where those causes and conditions might end up. But, but again, it's not something I really think about too much. Do you think it's possible to be here and now without thoughts? I think it is possible to be here now without any <laughs> thoughts. Um, I, I also think that when the centers are burned through completely, you know, when the survival and the grasping that's attached to identification really finally lets up, then the silent mind takes hold all of its own, you know. But, but you know, the, this is an amazing, amazing life and amazing bodies that evolved, yeah. right? Yeah. And we think that we have to be having thought to make everything work, but it's simply not true. <laughs> you know, we, we've learned how to operate already. If we can just get out of the way, life would just flow so naturally already, you know. Yeah, that brings me to the topic of surrender. Mm, one yeah. of my favorites. <laughs> oh, God, tell me about it. How do we learn? Is that something that we learn to do, to surrender? Or it's a shift in consciousness at some point and then naturally happens? Well, again, sort of being precise with language. You know, if, we, if I really am clear that there is no I here, right? right? right. Who is there to surrender? Mm, you know, who, who could be surrendered? <laughs> what I can sure. say is that I think in this, again, this magic and awe of, of this body, you know, that, that there seems to be forces or drives that are working that work on this, you know, work on our consciousness. Do I understand them? I, I don't think I can because they arise spontaneously, but there isn't, there is something about surrender. Right. And for me, I think it is burning down, you know, burning down what we thought was, what is not true. But ultimately, you know, what is here is this ground of being that's already here. You know, we're just stripping away the veils. So for me, that is the surrender, right? It's the surrender to views that have occluded the truth of what is here, you know, and this constant, constant being willing to let go. Because what is here is here. The only thing that's standing in the way is all of our preconceived thoughts mm, and ideas yeah. and perspectives and beliefs. <laughs> More importantly, beliefs. You know, yeah. beliefs have a great way of clouding, you know, what's really true. So in a way, it's really unlearning. Yeah, I think being aware of where our tendencies are of the grasping mm -hmm. and the thoughts and the yeah. following of thoughts. Yeah. And simply by pulling back from that, by dropping back into quiet, you know, the natural luminescent true nature is already there and just rises up, just letting go, constantly letting go, <laughs> I would say. Yeah. I remember this uh, from a Japanese, I think it was from Zen Buddhism, that they say done and forgotten mm. all the time, moment by moment. Done, mm -hmm. forgotten. To me, I often think of, um, I think there's a Japanese style of painting where it's almost just water on a type of paper. So the ink appears, but then disappears. Uh -huh. And I yeah. think about that all the time, right? It's like arising and then subsiding, arising and subsiding. You know, nothing's held on to. Everything arises and then subsides by itself. What do you think the purpose is to be here? Do we have a purpose? Yeah, I mean, I think these are fundamental questions, right? right. And, and I, this is where I always love to know what, what someone else's question, mm -hmm. you know, really means. Yeah. Like, what, what is it when someone's looking for purpose? This is where I would really ask. What, it, what is it to find that? How does that center you? I mean, from my experience with working with people and exploring these topics, I would always say what I come to and find in purpose not always, right? And this is, uh, I'm eliminating it to, uh, you know, some direct experience. So I don't want to limit it as a whole of what that means. But the purpose has a connection to something divine, usually. That there's a divine intelligence moving throughout the universe. And somehow, if I can line myself up with that, I too can unify with this divine intelligence. For me, I've never found that. Mm -hmm. I've never found a divine intelligence, right? And, and that was from seeking very hard. You know, for me, that's not what's here. I can't really put it into words, like you said before we were talking, before we started the recording. You know, putting things into words is really difficult because it's beyond mine. But I've never found purpose there. You know, I think purpose is one way that we grasp. It's one way that we grasp um, from a separate self at not wanting to feel separate. And we also grasp as trying to find an orientation in life through purpose and meaning. 
right? So the real surrender for me is letting go of all those concepts. What is it like to live without a center? You know, for the ego, that's frightening. But the true freedom is that, right? None of these things are important. Life is life. Life is flowing. How did this come to be? To be aware that we are in a body and, and be aware that there's separation even because there isn't. Well, gosh, I mean, these are huge questions um, to, to put uh, for me to answer. <laughs> um, I will do my mm. best, but um, far mm. from doing it justice. Uh, you know, I think, and then consciousness arose because of a body that is fed by food. You know, it's a very unique set of circumstances. You know, and consciousness, I, I, you know, in again, in a limited use of words, feels like a step down of, of awareness, absolute awareness, you know? And because of this gift of consciousness that has the capacity to be aware, you know, that's where self-awareness comes from. You know, it's this movement of consciousness you know, in this body. But without the body, the, the consciousness goes back to universal consciousness. Right. You know? There is no individual consciousness. It, it will diminish with the body. You know, so this real gift is the body. Mm, you know? yeah. The potential of the body and consciousness moving. And would you say that this is just, um, it's just an experience? Consciousness being in the body, and that's basically it doing whatever it is doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say it's the grand play, right? Mm -hmm. It arises and subsides within what I am, you know, which is awareness, right? So it's just always arising and subsiding. Nothing more than that. I don't attach any other meaning to it than that. It's simple. We tend to complicate things and grasp to too many ideas yeah, and concepts. Well, the ego loves grand complexity. Mm -hmm. right? That's what it really wants. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because for it to really face life as it is, is really kind of horrifying to the ego most of the times, right? You know, life is beauty and pain. The ego really doesn't want to hear that. You know, the ego really just wants beauty, <laughs> lack of pain, no suffering, right? You know, so to really face life of what it really is, you know, which is this push-pull, which is light and dark, which is contraction and expansion. Yeah, the ego is always looking for something to, to rise above that. No, I would say sink below it is the right term. You know, it likes to sink below through grand ideas, grand visions, experiences. Enlightenment, that's a word that we hear a lot. <laughs> what is enlightenment to you, Gregory? How would you describe that? Freedom, let me connect the word, yeah. I know we have been talking about what it seems to be already, the idea of freedom. Are there words to describe what freedom is? <laughs> yes, I think it's a surrender of identification, completely, honestly, fully, right? Nothing else. The eye drops away and we can return to what we really are. And again, you can't put that into words because this is the problem, right? If the ego essence is there, I could come up with all yeah, kinds right. of words for you, right? I could call it, mm -hmm. I could call it awareness. I could call it openness. I could call it emptiness and fullness. But the truth is when the subject and object disappear, when the perceiver and the perceived disappear, there's only one thing. So how can you describe only one thing? How can you look at yourself if okay. there's only one thing? Right? So that's where the words drop away, right? But that is the freedom. It's abiding in what we really are. And what does it feel like to be free? You know, I think there's going to be levels of freedom, right? There's levels of awakening as well. And, uh, you know, words always fall short there. Like, uh, you know, I could be more precise. Is there really levels? <laughs> well, not really. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not wait. Awakening <laughs> is truly a, a waking up from the eye. Is there a difference between intermittent mm -hmm. sort of awareness of that and an abiding? Yes. So I think getting down to what it feels like, I would say from the purest, purest absolute, you know, there is no feeling. That all drops away. Thoughts, feelings, um, experiences really drop away. So what, what is present is a luminous stability. The question is, is there any uh, movement in there where you are just going in and out of that kind of awareness, of free awareness? 
because as you mentioned before, we need um, some level of thoughts. We need functional, you call it, thoughts to function uh, day to day, moment by moment with the body. Is that possible, that freedom that, or that scent to be there all the time? Yeah, the body can take care of itself, right, Valeria? Yeah, I don't need to be tending to it. It's quite magical that way. Right. Again, we're so we're so conditioned to believe <laughs> yeah. that we have to be thinking to make it all work. But the truth is, we don't have control anyway. You know, I, I mean, that's the illusion. So, yes, I think it, it is possible. Right. That that is total freedom. Always there. Always there. And it can't really be forgotten. I guess that's what I want. Maybe this is where there's there's stages and processes that happen with awakening. But once you know that you are not the I, that can't be forgotten, right? That's all that's really important is the knowing. It's not a learning of the mind, right? That's knowledge, right? right. We can all talk from the mind. We can all know things from the mind, but that's not experience and that's not realization. But once you know something, right, that's beyond words, that didn't come from the mind, it can't be unknown. It shines out in every single moment. Sure, you might be captivated by thoughts here and there, right? Oh, but yeah. the actual knowing that you are not those thoughts can never be covered over again, right? So there's really no problem if the thoughts come in, even if you follow the thoughts, because the knowing that you are not those thoughts or beliefs is so permanent and stable. It can never go back. That's it, knowing. Yeah, like knowing, right? Direct experience, yeah. knowing. That's different, right? Yeah. 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 And and that is, I would say, a real good indication, right, when talking with other people. Because we can all be allured by what someone knows of the mind. But but the direct experience has a different quality. It's the only thing that can really take us home, right? Your direct experience is what is gonna help people. That's where it all starts. Yeah. When did you uh, discover this or so when uncovered the truth? Can you talk to me for a moment about the um the experiences that led you to that deeper understanding? Yes, I think, and you were mentioning this too, I think before we started the interview about seeking, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I would say I'm grateful that somehow sincerity was present from an early age. I was sincere in whatever that moment was, and it's taken many different forms, but that sincerity led me to a direct experience of emptiness. And that wasn't realization. So I want to be clear on that. It was the ego, the I, I would say the I, let's just, the ego is just a movement, you know, the I experiencing emptiness. So it had an object and subject relationship, but the realization or the seeing, I would say, let's leave realization out of it. The seeing of emptiness that truly there is emptiness at the, at the core of all form was devastating to my ego. And so for years, I was just in a collapse after that and spiral of meaninglessness. How do I move if everything's empty? What do I do? You know, drives and passions just dropping away. And that was years. But I would say that was the crucial moment that was then sort of the process that we were talking about surrendering, of just letting go, of being worn down. And I think if anything, that's what the spiritual mm. journey is. We're just wearing our drives and our ego down to finally it can just let go. And when it finally lets go, then again, the nature, the true nature that is here just, just unveils itself. And so, yeah, that was the biggest, that was the biggest part of the journey was the, the experience of emptiness. I hear a lot about the soul's journey that we have chosen to be here and to go through certain experiences. Is that another idea of the ego? I would say for me, I, I don't know if I want to frame it and box it in, other than saying that isn't my experience, Larry. I, there is not a soul to me. You know, that, that's one of the things that are sort of the long lineage of traditions and spirituality until you get to a certain point when you realize that collapses. Um, what I would say from the question, though, where I think it was stemming from, right, because you want to help people, right? Like, that's just a movement of love to me. But it has to be a pure movement of love. And so we often have to do our work of investigating and inquir inquiring into what our motivations are. Mm. Because oftentimes... The real motivation for helping is self-motivated. If, if I can make a better world, if I can help this person, I'll be more secure. 
Uh, you know, so I would really have to investigate that. I encourage us all to investigate when we really want to help someone. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there are pure movements of love from non-duality that will naturally have compassion and want to help. It's just we have to make sure they're coming from the cleanest place. So as for, again, soul, purpose, we're here, we chose. No, I can't say that is anything that lives in the direct experience I've had. But, but there is movement. Life is movement. Mm -hmm, yeah. And when all of our drives finally are diminished and stripped away, life still moves. <laughs> That's the magic of it. But at that point, it becomes just a pure expression of love. And if it's anything other than that, then I would say go back to the, go back to the work. Yeah, yeah. Go back to practice. Go back to <laughs> surrendering. Go back to letting go. Because, and, and I think I want to add one other piece, if you don't mind. Yeah. I think, what can we do to really help someone or, or help the world, even if that was really something that lived and was a concept <laughs> yeah. and we were searching for? I would say the only thing that anyone could really do of any real purpose and meaning, mm -hmm. if I wouldn't even put those words on it, <laughs> is to wake up, mm -hmm. right? right? Because duality is what, <clears throat> and identification is what is the suffering of the world right? It doesn't mean the world would change when all that drops away, right? It's the resistance to the world that drops away. And that is the suffering. The suffering is resistant to what is. And so by you liberating yourself, by awakening, then it just spills out. It gives someone else the opportunity to live in non-resistance. And isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it is. Do you have a, um, a definition for love? No. I don't. I recognize that many things arise in, in awareness, in consciousness. And, and it seems like love is a natural arising. You know, how could it not be if everything is one? Right. You know, if everything is one, wouldn't that just be natural right. of love to spill out for its own self? Right. You know, yeah, right. I mean, that's what I see it. I feel it's natural. Talk to me for a moment about the uh, inspiration and also the intention of writing your book, Songs of Silence, Poems to Accompany You on the Journey Home, Volume 1. Well, to be honest, I am a horrible writer. <laughs> <laughs> and mm -hmm. It was out of the recognition that, that there was this bubbling up yeah. of wanting to share my experience and also a recognition of this conditioning of mine that is not such a great writer and, and is more creative and has more um, lean towards the arts, that one day it just clicked. And, and I remembered that, that poetry was so natural to me and that a way for me to, to give what these experiences and share, it would be so appropriate if it was just more natural to me. And that was through more of an artistic form. And then once that clicked, it was it was like lightning. They just, I would wake up in the middle of the night and the poems would be there and I would just write them down. I would be walking <laughs> on the street and all of a sudden the next poem would be there and I would have to grab a piece, piece of paper and write them. So yeah, I mean, and that's what I love about poetry, right? They, they transcend the mind in, in its own way. They're not about knowledge in the traditional sense. They really tap into that deep sort of um, inspiration, you know, inspiration from, from what is. The first thing you, um, before the biography starts that you sent to me, you have this, uh, something that you wrote. What if I told you, you have always been and will always be everything you have ever been searching for? So this is, a, um, I mean, that's, um, that's everything. <laughs> that's the truth. Yeah, we are searching for something that we cannot find out there. It's here. You have been saying this. If we can simplify, I know the truth is very simple. It's just really letting go, surrender to, to what's happening now. And a lot of people ask the question, what about if what's happening now requires my actions? It requires me to use the functioning mind. So how can I stay here now and at the same time attend to life with this, what do you call, the silence, this perfume of the infinite? Well, that was beautifully put, I want to say. Well, I think we have all kinds of questions when we're looking out and in on something, right? And the question, so that, that usually speaks to the realization hasn't hit home yet. When the realization is there, those questions just don't 
mm-hmm. aren't appropriate any longer. <laughs> so I would say, you know, I, I, it all makes sense to be asking this question, but, but keep turning your attention to finding out who you are. Keep turning your attention to the direct experience. And then once that settles in, once that pops open, then those answers will be taken care of. <laughs> no more questions, right? Oh, how would I do this podcast without questions? <laughs> that would be an interesting one. <laughs> well, that would be interesting. But, you know, but that is the truth. We all struggle with that at some point <laughs> in the journey of truth. What will I do? Right? What will happen if, you know, if I'm coming from true nature? But, but again, I just want to say <laughs> life moves. Life is always moving. It's just the added meaning and extra layers are stripped around, uh, stripped down. So it just becomes pure, right? What you do is pure. What is about silence that leads us to inner peace and clarity? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm always careful with language, you know, and trying to be as precise as possible. Um, leading us to inner peace, I just want to be clear mm. that we are peace, right? <laughs> yeah, we right. are peace. So if anything, yeah. silence is mm-hmm. such a profound teacher because it strips away all the noise and the noise of the mind. And once the, the noise of the mind of the grasping subsides, then this natural permanent, stable, if we want to call it peace, you know, everyone will have different names, you know, is just there. So, but, but I also, you know, and you mentioned this before about um, the, the lawn being mowed, right? There's all yeah. kinds of different silence. Silence is all of it. It's just the mind chatter that obscures it. So once you're um, sort of have uh, that grounding in silence, you just, you feel it resounding out from everywhere. So the lawnmower becomes the expression of silence. The noise of a truck could mm-hmm. um, going down the highway, barreling down the highway could send mm-hmm. you in bliss. Truthfully, <laughs> because it's a movement of silence and you just feel it rage through your body. So it's this mind chatter, you know, it's the grasping. Yeah. And even um, accepting surrender to the grasping, <laughs> it might be another level. To might be right surrendered to it too. Okay, the mind is really interesting today. Um, it's going off. Oh, I I see that, and then um, yeah, letting go. There's there's all there's so many rungs to the ladder, right? I feel when you're on a journey. On one rung of the ladder, you might be saying one thing, and then on the next rung, you might demolish it. But that's just how it is. So on one rung, yes. What's really important is to catch any time that you're in conflict with life. Because again, that's the ego trying to escape what really is. So here we are, this mind that's chattering. Is that a problem? No, it's not a problem. It truly is not a problem. But then on another rung in the ladder, we might be talking about the quiet mind and abiding in in true nature. And at that point, it is it has a different quality to it. But truthfully, we have to come to complete terms with life first. And that is an acceptance of all of it, right? Like, oh boy, my mind's busy today. It's not a problem. It really isn't. (laughs) Yes. So your book is divided into four chapters. You have the, uh, you flow with the the seasons. So you call them spring poems and then summer, fall, winter. Why did you choose to divide your book in such a way? I also just want to say, I'm going to answer that question. And then I realized that I have this poem right here about silence that I yeah. think would be really fun to read. If yes, that's okay. please. Yes. Why did I divide it? Well, I mean, we all have these trajectories, right, on the relative level. And this relative level of experience for this body-mind, you know, was heavily into mysticism. There, I, I've tracked the seasons for so long. I've tracked rituals and ceremonies. And so I think it's just a natural spilling out of aligning with nature still. It's still there. There's sort of the resonance of that. I still find joy in that. It, it still <laughs> brings me joy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, please, the poem, um, Silence. Silent or silence you want to read? I have I have selected some of them here, but we oh, might not yeah. have enough time. So I would love to hear the one you have. Yeah. Well, I would also, yeah, love to read a few. Um, this one is this silent. I've experienced this silence of an early morning sunrise, of a vast desert plain in midday heat, of a redwood forest at dusk, of a temple in night prayer. And I've experienced this silence of a truck thundering down the highway before dawn, of dogs barking endlessly in the afternoon, of children playing after school, of loud music keeping me from sleep. I've discovered all is the same one thing silence, 
The real noise is the mind chatter. Once that subsides, every distinction of sound dissolves. There is no more looking for silence. There is only silence. I thought it was interesting what you wrote about the uh, intelligent by design. And I think I highlighted something here where you say, when I say there is nothing here that has the potential to become a trap too, romantic sounding to an, an ego, purposeful, a grand notion to reality. I would love for you to read also the poem, Being, Consciousness, and Bliss. Oh, here it is. Uh-huh. Being, Consciousness, Bliss. Okay. What brought us into this will surely take us back out. The sense of being I am arose as the rare gift of self-consciousness suddenly came upon us. The truth of being who I am arises with the rare longing of consciousness to look for the self. The bliss of being what I am will arise when consciousness develops the rare ability to abide in the cell. There is walking around the lake, touching your toes to the water, and there is going deep in, abandoning all your clothes. These are the doors. These are some of the keys. What you choose to do with them now is entirely up to you. Yeah. Wow. I love that. I also love the sincerity one I have selected here. Would you read that? That would be wonderful. That would be the last poem. Here we go. Sincerity. There is only sincerity, absolute and resolved. And there is only life, constantly moving for its own sake. Living a sincere life is the path. Nothing else is required. What our sincerity draws us to experience gives its value. It is this simple. We live by our deepest motivations always. And we follow through according to our level of commitment to that movement. If we have absolute sincerity to uncover our true nature, no matter what, no matter the consequences, life will take care of itself in an entirely unique and surprising way that cannot and will not ever be repeated. Wow. Yeah, I love your work. Thank you, Gregory. Oh, thank you. It's just that, yeah, everything's connected. There's no separation. So when we know that, then love arises. It has to. And compassion. Right? And compassion. So what is the difference, really? I, you know, I'm sorry. I've never thought of the distinction. Yeah. What is the difference for you? If we have to use a word for that, the scent, for that movement, natural movement, it would be love. And if I go one step further, it would be unconditional love. A love that's not conditioned, but it's I also think taking a moment to let that settle in because I haven't mm -hmm. had that question. Uh, compassion seems like something mental as well, right? It's a mental understanding of oneness, right? It's a or empathy. It's the ability to empathize with another, whereas love feels like a pure movement of energy mm -hmm. to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Th this is it to me. What comes to me. Every time is that like when I see it doesn't matter who it is, what it is, it's just beautiful <laughs> in its own way. And there's this deep, not connection, but awareness of I am you, you and me, how beautiful. And it doesn't matter what form, it, it's just beautiful. Yeah. I also want to ask you because this is something that I think is really important distinction because in the dualistic world, love is attached to hate. Mm, right, and and right, so that's right. really important, you know, that love can be conditional. That type of love that is dualistic is conditional. It only comes if we get something or if we get this met, then we love. So the love we're talking about is a non-dualistic type of love that at some point I would love to find maybe a different word for. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, because, huh, because, we, yeah. because the other one is so connected to love and hate. That, that this is something different, right? Yeah. This, is, this is a movement of unification that is, that is compassionate. And yeah, when you say compassionate, it might be this longing to experience that. <laughs> when I see another human being not 
fully engaging this movement. I'm like, oh my God, what's happening here? <laughs> and then there's this, yeah, you may call it compassion, this trying to, to bring that clarity to them somehow so they can experience that too, because it's so beautiful. Yeah. And just remember though, you know, to be as clear as possible, you're bringing it to yourself. There's only mm. one thing. <laughs> right. So yeah. the moment the separation comes uh. in is where the, is where the dualism comes in. So you're only bringing it to yourself. And then when I think about that, it then becomes a lot more playful <laughs> and like, oh, this is interesting. And, and it's light. It's very light. Yeah. When that's that all, comes. <laughs> that always happens when the ego straps strapping away. The, that is the, yeah. I think, another indication, right? Things become simple. Yeah. Things become naturally joyful. And we also take pleasure in the ordinary. Yes. The moment we start taking pleasure in the extraordinary, we know that's not, that's not coming from truth. Yeah, there's lightness to it, playfulness, and yeah. You get to talk about truth. What more exciting? <sighs> what an exciting hour to spend together. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Gregory. Thank you. Thank you. Where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Um, you can. Anyone is welcome to go to my website. It's called fireandemptiness.com. And I think um, Valeria, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I have the perfect poem to end our talk. Yeah. Is that okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay, this one's called Come Home. It's time to come home. Too much time has already been spent searching outside yourself for worth and value. To be able to accept and trust who you naturally are, come home. Too much time already invested in the idea that someone else can make you feel complete. To fill the deep well of longing inside come home. You can no longer hide from the pain of separation, of believing you are this body, and it is time to come home. It's time indeed, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so we'll talk soon, for sure. We'll be in touch, Gregory. Mm, thank you, Valeria, for this opportunity. Many blessings to you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Gregory Bondi and his works, please visit fireandemptiness.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.